Hey Greenville Oaks, I hope you are having a great day. If you are a first time guest with us, my name is Wade and I'm one of the ministers on staff and I'm usually the one who does the preaching on Sundays. But today it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker. John Seibert has been a friend of mine for a long time. He's currently serving as the CEO and president of City Square, an organization that is doing a tremendous amount of good in Dallas and beyond. And anytime I'm with John, whether I'm hearing him speak or at a meeting with community leaders or having coffee with him, I'm always both challenged and encouraged by what he has to say. And I know today you too will find him to be a challenging encouragement. So John, please come preach. Poverty has a way of robbing you of the future. And all your energy is spent on what can I do to get through the day. City Square is a force for good in Dallas uh, and in all the communities we serve in terms of being a community of neighbors and friends that seek opportunity for all. And so what we're against is poverty and its effects on people. What we're really for is that power of community and friendship and our shared humanity really lifting everybody up. What I love is seeing really committed people come together to bring hope and opportunity to our neighbors. And so sometimes that's the power of watching all of our different food programs that really have a way of saying, I'm gonna fill your belly today, but that also gives you hope for tomorrow. If you were to come to our Opportunity Center and look in our food pantry, you'll see that most of the people that we're serving are people that work. They just experience too much month at the end of the money. So they can come into our food pantry, not only get access to food in quantity, but they also get quality. They have a place where they can shop with full dignity, pick out what they want, know it's gonna help them get to the end of that month where the money ran out. I just love when neighbors get everything they need in one city. Access to health care, mental health services, our workforce empowerment program. We help people get housed, stay housed. Trying to figure out how to not just meet their most urgent needs, but meet all their needs. Hearing not just what's happening in the moment, but their story and their journey and their life. It helps people feel empowered to say, I can dream, I can aspire to have not only enough for today, but to think about a future. There's another really important face of poverty that we work with, and that's youth. And so our track program is really a one-stop shop for youth that are aging out of the foster care system. I always like the, it's like the, <laughs> like, like a father, that male figure that everyone needs if they don't have. Everything I have now, I have because I just gotta tell people, you know, my request and it's there. We're gonna walk alongside of them to fight for them until they have access to opportunity like all the rest of their neighbors. It changed my whole life. Finally gave me something to hold on to. I'm just one story, but there are thousands and thousands of people. To really heal our community, to ensure that opportunity and prosperity is expanded to all, to ensure that we have the best future as a city, as a state, as a country. An investment in City Square says, we're gonna, we're gonna build back together. We're gonna invest in people, all people, uh, and we're gonna have a more prosperous, more hopeful, shared future. You may never know them, you may never meet them. You're really, really making a difference in people's lives. The fact that, that City Square is turning 35 is a tribute to the power of this mission. I would love to never reach our 50th birthday because we've solved the problems of poverty in Dallas, Texas. But until that day, just know City Square is going to be here. We're going to show up and we're not going to quit until the fight is won. Church. Uh, my name is John Seibert. I'm president and CEO of City Square. Uh, and I shared that video with you just so you'd have a sense of, of what City Square does. Uh, we exist to fight the causes and effects of poverty. 
through service, advocacy, and friendship. Uh, I've been at City Square for 10 years. Uh, before that, I spent almost 10 years preaching at uh, what is now called Care Church. It used to be called Richardson East Church of Christ, just right down the road. Uh, so we've been uh, church neighbors for years. Um, I've had the privilege of, of working with or, or being friends with uh, most of your ministers, <laughs> many of your preachers over the last uh, few decades. I've known Wade since college. We used to play intramural basketball together and have some classes together. Know Colin Packer very well. He and Holly both now work with City Square and their vision of the gospel, God's spirit has really led them to do what we do and love working with them. Uh, Greg Pertle and I were young ministers together. I was the old man on staff at the ripe old age of 28. Uh, and Greg and I somehow survived and made it to this day anyway. Uh, so many of you are friends and neighbors, and I'm so thankful for you and, and for this church and for this opportunity uh, to share with you. Uh, usually I talk to people about poverty um, and the power of poverty and, and why we need to fight against it. Um, and that's an important conversation to have in our context because poverty is a word that's hard for us to get a hold of and to really fully understand. And in a context that is so affluent and prosperous, it's hard for us to really know how to deal with uh, those who don't have what they need. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of the things I think I like to describe is it's, it's like natural disasters. Hurricanes, wildfires, winter storms, tornadoes, when those hit, usually we see them and they're front page news. Recently, Hurricane Ian went through the Florida coast up into the Carolinas. Immediately, that is on the front of every newspaper. It leads off every newscast. We are all aware of the devastation that is inflicting some of our neighbors. And there's a, an appropriate response, a mobilization where the Red Cross and agencies like it mobilize to go help. FEMA, the government resources, wait right outside the state lines for when it's safe and they go in and they rescue and they restore and they rebuild. Faith communities rally, neighborhoods rally. People see the desperate need, they see the damage and the devastation and they know the only appropriate response is to run and help. Poverty is that natural disaster, that hurricane ravaging people's lives, destroying some of our communities but it never makes the news. It's never on the front page. We rarely hear about it and we don't see it. And so very few of us go run and help. And yet the truth about poverty is that it is a storm, it is a hurricane, it is a wildfire raging in the lives of many families, many children, many individuals in this community. People are suffering and dying without anybody coming to help. And so what I usually try to do is help us have eyes to see and ears to hear the needs of our neighbors who don't have enough. Um, and that can be really hard in our context because we are such a wealthy nation. And we are so segregated in terms of how wealth and poverty uh, show up. We tend to have neighborhoods and cities of highly concentrated wealth where everybody is doing well, where everybody has enough, where the self-storage companies can't build enough self-storage containers for us to keep all of our extra stuff that doesn't fit in our three-car garages, in our attics, in our sheds at home. And yet there are other communities that don't need storage containers. They just need a place to live. It's also hard in our context to talk about poverty because our history is being a nation of freedom and opportunity. Of people coming to these shores to find a better life and the promise of a better day. Uh, and many of the folks that came, you remember, you know, we'll have Thanksgiving in a, a month or so and we'll tell our kids about the Puritans and about 
you know, the first Thanksgiving with the natives and we'll have the little black hats and the little white belt buckles. Well, those Puritans that came, they had a certain religious view formed by the Reformation by people like Martin Luther and John Calvin that believed in kind of predestination in a sense of like this irresistible grace of, of those who were in God's kingdom, those who are God saved and chosen, knowing who they are, and then others being lost and outside of God's love and God's kingdom. And the whole focus of religion in our country since the birth has been about how do you find those lost people and get as many saved as possible? And in a country where these folks committed to hard work and economic prosperity find it, American Christianity has a certain math equation around wealth and poverty. We tend to think that rich equals saved. Rich equals blessed. Rich equals righteous. Rich equals responsible. And poor equals lost. Poor equals cursed. Poor equals lazy. Poor equals irresponsible. The gospel of Jesus Christ says that's really bad math, folks. And sometimes rich doesn't equal blessed or saved. Sometimes it equals selfish and greedy. And poor doesn't equal cursed by God. No, the gospel says, Jesus says himself, I have come to bring good news to the who? To the poor. And, and so a lot of my work at City Square is trying to change our bad math, trying to break through our bad attitudes about wealth and poverty and help us to see and to hear the cries of our neighbors in need. And then once we do, to actually mobilize, to take action, to care for those who are drowning and dying. Even in this country. But today I've got a really interesting assignment. Because the text we have is this text in, in the gospel, or that out of the gospel of Luke as it moves into the second book of Luke, his book of Acts. As we go from the ministry of Jesus to the birth of the church and the power of God's spirit is pouring through the church and the church is proclaiming good news and communities of faith are forming. We hear at the end of chapter four in the book of Acts, that the way the power of God was manifested is that everybody shared a same heart and a same attitude. And they even shared their possessions with one another. People would sell their property, they would sell their goods, their possessions, even their homes in order to bring that wealth to the community and distribute it to whoever had need. And Luke says, this amazing new economy of Jesus forms to where nobody had any need. Every need was met. It echoes back to the book of Deuteronomy, where when the people of Israel were being formed into God's chosen nation, Deuteronomy 15, you will be blessed by the Lord and your favor with the Lord will be seen and manifested in that in your community, there will be no need among you. And the world will know you are God's chosen people because of your economy. How ironic that the guy that works on poverty every day 
gets to talk about wealth. And as much as I spend my energy and focus on how dangerous and destructive poverty is, Luke spends a lot of his time and energy focused on how dangerous and destructive affluence is. Time and time again, warning us about the death and destruction that comes when you have too much or when you put your trust in money and possessions instead of fully in God's love as it's been made known to you in Jesus Christ. And so in Luke's gospel, there's stories, parables, like the one of the the rich fool who's making so much money it doesn't all fit in his barn. And instead of thinking, you know what, I have more than I need, I bet I should meet the needs of others, he says, you know what, I need to get a good architect, I need to get me a good general contractor, I need my agent to put a deposit down on some land. It's time to build bigger barns. And the parable says that that very night, that the man is laid out over the drawings of his new, big, expansive expansion, new, top-of-the-line barn. God says, you fool, you're going to die tonight. And none of this stuff gets to go with you. William Willimon is a retired Methodist preacher uh, who once in a sermon talked about this dynamic of how we, we tend to uh, rally the elders and our prayer warriors when somebody loses a job, when somebody gets a bad diagnosis from the doctor. It's crisis time. We need to pray. Our brother and sister, they're in trouble. And he said, if we really took the gospel of Luke seriously, we'd rally the elders and the prayer warriors anytime somebody got a promotion. Anytime somebody moved into a bigger house. Anytime somebody got into a nicer neighborhood and say, brothers and sisters, John's in trouble. He's in a lot of spiritual danger. They promoted him to VP at the bank. Call the elders. We need to pray. Wealth and possessions are dangerous because they tempt us to put our trust in them instead of in God. And the comforts of stuff will divide our loyalty and allegiance to where some of us will stay, some of our heart will stay committed to the gospel of Jesus. But a part of our heart will worship at the altar of self-reliance and my own hard-earned security. This text in Acts 4 often gets debated about as some kind of prescription for what kind of economy our world and the nations within it should operate under. Which is maybe why Wade gave it to me to preach. Let the guest preacher go speak in a capitalistic society, the text that looks a whole lot like communism and socialism. (laughs) People selling, the rich selling their stuff and giving it to the poor, everybody having everything in common. Doesn't sound like free market capitalism. But turning this text into a debate about which economy is the best economy for a nation to operate under would be a huge distraction. And is not the point. 
And honestly, never in scripture, especially not in this amazing story of how the church is born and, it, and spreads the good news of Jesus throughout the world that we see in the book of Acts, never does anyone stand up and proclaim the good news of capitalism. Come and be baptized into the free market. Never does Peter or Paul or anyone stand up and say, come and join the commune and embrace socialism. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. No, the story is that when the Spirit of God fills the people of God, the followers of Christ, we are transformed into a new economy that's needed in no matter what broader economy we find ourselves in. Because the truth about history and about human nature and about all the economies of the world is they all find a way to reward selfishness and greed and to oppress the poor. Whether it's Russian oligarchs with billions of dollars while there's bread lines in a communist country or free market billionaires in America who have concentrated wealth amongst a tiny group of people while many in our country starve. In 2014, Dallas, Texas pulled off an amazing feat. We managed to have the highest percentage increase of millionaires in the entire country. More people became millionaires in Dallas, Texas in 2014 than anywhere else in the US while at the same time, Dallas managed to rise to number two in the country, second to only Detroit in the rate of childhood poverty in our county. The second highest percentage of kids living below the poverty line with the first highest percentage of new millionaires. That takes some work. And the only thing that we can do to battle that kind of inequality is hear the good news of Jesus Christ and let it transform who we are and how we live and how we spend the money we're given. And so we see this radical economy of Jesus that spares us from too much and from too little, and creates this community where everybody will go to bed tonight having what they need. Only the Spirit of God can create such a radical economy and can move us past our obsession with me to give freely for the we. I saw the best story yesterday. I was watching college game day, getting ready for college football. And they had this story called The Imposter. This kid's a Mexican-American kid, doesn't even go to Texas A&M, but he went to A&M this time a year ago for the A&M Alabama game. And he went to a tailgate for Latin American students that his, some of his friends who were A&M students were going to. And at the tailgate, he finds on the ground a VIP badge, not for Kyle Field, but for a radio tailgate. One of the radio stations had this big tailgate they were doing, and it was a VIP sticker for that. Well, this kid decides, I'm gonna see how far I can get with this VIP sticker. So he's, he didn't have a ticket to the game, wasn't planning to go to the game. He's like, but I'm gonna see if I can get into the game. So he goes up to security, I'm a VIP, come on through. He gets into Kyle Field without a ticket. And now he's like, man, I'm not gonna go sit up on the third deck in the cheap seats. I'm gonna see what I can do with this VIP ticket. So he tells one of the ushers he's a recruit and he needs to know where the recruits are sitting. He got lost from the group. And the guy says, oh, let, let me get one of the recruiting coordinators. And he's like, uh-oh. So here comes this guy in the A&M, you know, A&M shirt. And he's like, how am I gonna work this? 
Well, he <laughs> relies on his ethnic heritage and he begins to speak Spanish. <laughs> and to say, he's a, he starts to make, I'm a kicker. <laughs> oh, this guy's a kick, because this kid did not look like a big burly foot. He was not built like me. So they go, oh, this kid's a kicker from Mexico. We gotta get him with the recruits. And they take him down and he shows pictures of, from his phone of him now sitting on the third row, 50 yard line with other recruits watching this game. A&M upsets Alabama, fans rush the field, he's on the field, he's like, I'm gonna see if this VIP sticker can get me in the locker room. And he grabs on some of the shoulder pads of the players, he just follows them in the locker room, flashes the VIP badge, they come on in. Now he's in the locker room. And there's video of him in the huddle of all the players on a knee as Jimbo Fisher, the head coach, gives them the celebratory speech. And he's right there. And then after he's taken pictures with players, he goes up to Jimbo and tells him he's a recruit from Mexico that's a kicker. Jimbo takes a picture. He's like, I wanna send a picture to my mom and dad back in Mexico. Sure, kid, got a picture of him with the head coach. Hangs out, celebrates with the players, then walks out of Kyle Field. The imposter. <laughs> Spent all night as a VIP. Many of us spend so much of our time trying to become VIPs. There was a guy on the same journey in scripture, a rich young lawyer. And he asked Jesus, Jesus, I'm on, I'm on the track to success. What do I have to do to succeed in religion? What do I have to do to be seen as righteous and good? And Jesus says, well, what does scripture say? Well, it says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, do that. You're good. But the man wanted to really justify himself. And he said, so, no, Jesus, tell me, like, what, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells a story that most of us have heard a million times about a good Samaritan. A man is beaten and bloodied and robbed by some robbers on the road and he's left for dead. One very righteous religious teacher comes by and either doesn't see or chooses not to see the suffering of his neighbor as he passes by. And he heads along his way. Another religious person walks by. Same thing, doesn't respond to the desperate needs of this neighbor. Finally, a Samaritan comes by, an outcast, somebody that's looked down on as a half-breed, is not fully righteous like pure Jews, an outsider. And this outsider immediately stops, begins to tend to the wounds of this beaten man, binds up his wounds, takes him to get help, pays for his care, stays to make sure that there's nothing else that's needed, ready to pay for another night for whatever intervention, interventions are needed to care for his neighbor. He uses his possessions to ensure that needs are met. And Jesus asked the rich young ruler, so tell me, who was the neighbor to this man? the one that stopped, the one that acted, the one that used his possessions to meet the need. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Right after Acts 4, there's a story in Acts 5. It may be what Wade preaches next week. It won't hurt us if we hear it twice. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They come to church, having been asked for everyone to sell their goods to meet the needs of those in the community. 
and they pretend that they've sold everything and that they're coming to give all of their goods to God. But they've decided to keep some back, to have a rainy day fund, to make sure they fund their own retirement. And they lie and say, no, we are freely giving everything we have. Well, first it's Ananias and he drops dead on the spot. And then Sapphira comes and she keeps up the same lie and she drops dead on the spot. Two people who show up appearing to be religious VIPs and they were both imposters they didn't truly believe the good news it hadn't truly changed their hearts it hadn't truly infected them with the radical generosity and hospitality of God or else they would have given freely. We live in a world that asks the wrong question. It asks, how can I move on up? How can I be in the right neighborhood? Who can I narrow the qualifications down for to say they are worthy to be my neighbor? Jesus says, no, the question we are to ask is, who needs a neighbor? Whose neighbor am I? Christ didn't die for some people. Christ died for all. God didn't create just some people in God's image. God created all things in God's image. So the days of us living the lie of us versus them, of good versus evil, of rich versus poor, of whatever other divisions you want to create to keep us from truly experiencing the spirit-filled power of God's love in Jesus Christ. It's time to quit living the lie. It's time for no more imposters. It's time to know that the poor have always been God's VIPs. And that God's love is generous enough and God's economy is productive enough that we can give freely until there is no need among us. May the power of the gospel spare us from the dangers of wealth. May money and possessions never become an idol that we worship in place of our king. And may the good news of Jesus not only flow out of our mouths, but also out of our pocketbooks. Go in peace and live the